Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Ron Murray. Also, I had the opportunity to get a session from him, and it was an amazing experience. He uses this powerful modality called manual regulation therapy, where the slightest movement of the body with his hands can create a huge shift in your matrix and nervous system. Please join us in this interesting discussion about this powerful healing modality. Karma Hub with two Bs. It's a learning channel centered around a wide variety of non-traditional healing modalities and the practitioners that offer them. So please click the Karma Hub like button and the Karma Hub subscribe button. And I truly hope that you enjoy this talk. Thank you so much. You can't have disease or dysfunction without having a dysfunctional autonomic nervous system. And that's okay. simply broken down into the sympathetic system or the fight or flight response and the parasympathetic system, which is regenerative and uh, supports the immunity. So you can tell me your history, you can tell me your story, but as soon as I put my hands on you, I'm gonna get the story from your body because the imprints of what has happened to you from birth to wherever you are at whatever stage of life you're in, it's gonna come up for me. If not in the first session, it's gonna be an unfolding as we do more and more of the work. When you, when you learn cranial work, you learn one entry point into this mm -hmm. system. One entry point. There are a thousand different entry points because acupuncture on some level is going to reduce sympathetic charge and balance autonomic nervous system. So most of what everybody's doing is doing some level of that. It's just this, I'm moving in and out of so many different systems that the response seems to be much greater than those separate modalities themselves. There's a lot of work that's done. I may do between 500 and 1,000 different gentle manipulations in one treatment, and that's going to have a profound effect because you understand the manipulations, they actually turn into information. Most of the progressive problems, most of the middle age problems that, that classically uh, conventional medicine doesn't do a very good job with, uh, they do a very good job at trying to manage those illnesses. But, right. you know, you'll never hear a conventional physician talk about curing something like diabetes or right. you know, something that nature uh, where, where, you know, we're really trying to and we can't always do this because I think there's so many variables into disease states and dysfunctions that you can't know all of them. But at least what we're trying to do is trying to do a deeper dive into the causality and to try to change that. What would the, the name of this particular modality be that you practice? What, what I practice, and it's been a development, it's called manual regulation therapy, because okay. the intention of the work is what I do is I find aberrations or anomalies in the extracellular matrix in the body, which runs through absolutely everything. Then that takes me to a localized area in which I get even a, a better indication of what the issues are, because it could be the joint, it could be vascular, it could be lymphatic, it could be deep in the matrix. There's a lot of different structures that you're led to in order to do these very, very gentle manipulations that I do. But okay it seems like the total outcome of what I do. And, and I've used, um, so I was get, ultimately getting there, but when I got my doctorate in integrative medicine, I was trained in three functional assessment devices. One is I used a high powered research microscope to do dark field analysis. And, and I really love that. Uh, I learned a lot. I studied with the Germans, uh, Dr. Rao, who runs a Paracelsus clinic. I took his two year, biological medicine program. I mean, it, it was just a, a really great time in my life because I was putting all these different modalities and finding out where they intersect with the body of work that I was doing with my hands. So that's where this extracellular matrix comes from. It, it comes from a guy by the name of Pissinger, who was a German and um, an incredible research scientist. And that's where it all started for me. Uh, is get, getting a very, very deep understanding of, of the function and um, the influence that that matrix has on life itself. 
Well, um, you know, so I had a friend of mine who came to see you not long ago and well, she was blown away. <laughs> I'll just start there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what she found so unusual, um, and she's like, you know, Lauren, this really like walking away from it. It says, I'm, I'm kind of, um, it, it feels like energy, like real deep energy work, like, uh, uh, energy medicine work because that's that's how it feels to me and I know that she's done a lot of that sort of work in the past um, and but yet the the description of you know the placement of your hands and the touch that was required um, it it wasn't like anything that I um, really had heard of before um, so it was all very fascinating and she was you know once again really blown away by it and and very impressed um, so you know, it, it really kind of, it kind of raises an eyebrow. I mean, that's why, why don't more people hear about this sort of thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> One thing is it's, it's, it's very unique work because it's really the collective. I have three degrees and it's really the collective of everything that I've learned and uh, understanding or having an understanding of how I believe the body works uh, is a, a great advantage as to using the work. So say, for instance, I'm working with you. Uh, I get these imprints of, of the places that are rigid in your body. So you can tell me your history. You can tell me your story. But as soon as I put my hands on you, I'm going to get the story from your body because the imprints of what has happened to you from birth to wherever you are at whatever stage of life you're in, it's going to come up for me. If not in the first session, it's going to be an unfolding as we do more and more of the work. Wow! So that's that's kind of how it how it um, progresses in terms in terms of the work. And again, because I'm moving into so many different systems, there's a lot of work that's done. I may do between 500 and a thousand different gentle manipulations in one treatment, and that's going to have a profound effect because you understand the manipulations they actually turn into information and then the body's got to go, okay, what do I do with this information now? And so the, the next 24 to 48 hours, typically most people are reorganizing around that information. And so that information puts them back within what I call their physiological adaptive range. Everybody okay. has a physiological adaptive range. If you look at a number line at zero, you have plus three on one side, negative three on the other, that may be your physiological adaptive range. And when you're in that physiological adaptive range, you're loving life or you're liking life. Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> when you get out of that physiological adaptive range, you end up having dysfunction and ultimately you have disease. And um, so what this work does is I get this information from you of, okay, where are these vortexes or where are these structures that are not moving. So it's the inherent motility uh, that is the driving force of the work. And I'm led to exactly what structures that's in as a result of this extracellular matrix. Okay. Okay. So it's like, in a real basic way, it's like my hands are like biofeedback receptors. I pick up this information. I make a change. The totality of the change in that treatment is really what influences things. It helps to normalize the autonomic nervous system and then bring you back within your physiological adaptive range. And that's kind of how I see it uh, working. So yeah, yeah, I remember you mentioning before that you actually do a like a body scan. Um, and I, I guess you you pink your your hands are sensitive and you can you have you can tap into what the body needs by doing this body scan. Yes. Yeah, so I do a, I do what's called a gross body scan. And that gives me a lot of information about uh, various restrictions in the body um, of vortexes in the body where people are moving around something because uh, everybody adapts. I mean, the true nature of being a human being is being able to adapt and to compensate to various issues that have happened in our life from traumatic birth injuries on, right? right? And so again, it's when you get out of that physiological adaptive range that you have problems. So when I do this body scan, I am directed to those areas that 
aren't moving, that simply lack the natural occurring motility because uh, our body is this fluid model. And so there should be constantly moving. Things are being constantly broken down and laid down all the time. So like every five to seven years, you have a, a completely new musculoskeletal system. Right. You know, once exactly. a year, your once a year, your liver is totally regenerated. Right. So, so that's a, those are the types of things that are that are also expressed in this model. And there's a, a knowledge base of this constant flux that I'm dealing with. So, I pick up, I do the body scan, and then I go to a much more localized area. So, like, say I do the body scan and I'm attracted to your left hip, then I'll go locally to do a deeper dive into okay, what tissues or structures are influenced in this. And then I start to treat them and I use very gentle manipulative techniques in order to do that. And what that causes and what's very, very important here, whether the patient feels it or not, if there's rigidity in the body or a lack of motility, there's a upregulation in what's called a sympathetic charge. And if you have a sympathetic charge, that means that you have a vasoconstriction effect around that area, whether you feel it or not, and a slight inflammatory process developing, because that's what happens when there's congestion in a particular area. So I can feel those sympathetic charges, and I do these gentle manipulations to downregulate or to normalize those sympathetic charges. So you can imagine, maybe someone has 10, 20 of these that are, are pretty significant, by the end of the session, uh, this is going to be altered. And again, within 24 to 48 hours, that's typically when you get the biggest bang with the work. Although after that, you still process it, but it's on a much like subconscious level. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I have a friend of mine who's a uh, cranial sacral therapist. Right. And um, when she describes kind of tuning into the body, you know, she also does a, like a scan and she, she talks largely about tuning into the, uh, uh, parasympath, uh, what is it called? The sympathetic and parasympathetic, um, is it nervous system? Is that yes. right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's one of many things that you kind of tune into. I mean, are right. your, your right. hands so, just really, uh, uh, sensitive to those particular energies or how, yeah, how do but, you go about but sensing it's really, that? It's really that, well, teaching it is very difficult. So what I ended up doing in, in the, my doctoral thesis that I, that I did get published, I was fortunate enough to do two international conferences on, on this work. And so what I do in the first one is it's really about talking a lot about initially the autonomic nervous system. And then it's chronologically going to, through the development of how this came about for me, okay. So because it's it's very important to understand that development to get any sense of what I'm actually doing. So, um, so the autonomic nervous system is very very important, but two thirds of the body are internal organs. If you don't know how to evaluate the motility or motion of those internal organs, you're going to miss two thirds of potentially what could be happening with this patient. So although right. cranial sacral therapy has a very, very good place, and I've been trained in advanced cranial work, this is really the synthesis of a lot of different disciplines right. and a lot of intu intuition and a lot of research that I did on my own to put this together. So that's why it's called manual regulation therapy, because at no particular time am I in one particular system. You know, gotcha. if I'm at the brain and I'm working at the brain, if you wanted to say, OK, well, he's doing cranial work now. I mean, I would be OK with that. But the totality of the work is to influence the autonomic nervous system. And that's not the way cranial sacral therapy is taught. When you when you learn cranial work, you learn one entry point into this mm -hmm. system, one entry point. There are a thousand different entry points because. Acupuncture on some level is going to reduce sympathetic charge and balance autonomic nervous system. So most of what everybody's doing is doing some level of that. It's just this I'm moving in and out of so many different systems that the response seems to be much greater than those separate modalities themselves. That makes sense. Does that yes. make sense to you? It, it does. Yes, absolutely. Good. 
It's almost yeah. like the some of the methods in cranial sacral therapy, for example. That's just one of many methods you use to get to, you know, um, to to get your person where you want to get them. <laughs> exactly. But always the intention is is to balance that autonomic nervous system because if I can do that, uh, you can you can reverse illnesses, and that's huge because everybody's process is different. And so you never know uh, how the patient's going to respond to something. If, if someone comes mm -hmm. to me for a localized problem, oftentimes, you know, they'll tell me, oh yeah, by the way, I had insomnia for 20 years and it's gone now. And I'm going, wow, you never mentioned that in your history, you know, That's so cool. <laughs> and, 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 you know, so it's, it's, um, it's very interesting. I, I've just been treating post COVID patients and I had a, a post-COVID patient that's had the cough since COVID, and it was four months ago. And after three sessions, I treated her lung and her metastinum. She has no more cough. Wow. Yeah. And, yeah, and I, so, I love to hear stories like that. That's so yeah, amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so here at NIHA, we're uh, starting to put together a, an entire integrative uh, protocol to treat some of the post-COVID patients because- you know, that's a group of walking wounded individuals with, that aren't receiving a lot of benefit from conventional uh, medicine at the, at the moment. So are you doing these methods um, solely by yourself at your practice, or do you have other people that are working with you to, um, you know, at, at, at the same time? Well, no, see, I, I was a partner here way back in the early 1990s. And so there are a lot of people that are still around that are very, very aware and are patients of mine themselves. So they understand the work and being in the same place, I can walk over to the dentist if, he, if we're treating a mutual patient and I can go, okay, uh, this is what I'm seeing, boom, 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 boom. And okay. he's got then much greater understanding of what his needs are to do from a dental perspective or, gotcha. or a, a physician I may come in with the patient uh, with them. But it's not like, like back in the 90s, I had the largest study group in the Washington DC area. I had between 25 and 40 patients, I mean, 40 students, right? Gotcha, okay. And uh, so I would, um, I would teach them all and I would allow them because this was at that time like a university setting. So I could have a group of patients come in uh, ha have my patient sign a waiver and I could hook three or four different patients in the one, one, in the one, I'm sorry, three or four different students in the one patient. Gotcha. So I had the flexibility to teach that way and be able to observe what everybody was doing, have a Q and a afterwards. So that was a very gratifying time too. Yes. But in these days um, it doesn't really afford me uh, to be able to do that on that level again. That and makes perhaps sense. Perhaps at some time, um, I mean, I still have uh, all my teaching stuff and so forth. And perhaps sometime there'll be enough demand uh, for that uh, to create another variation of that in some way. Right. But I, I guess you work amongst other uh, doctors or medical professionals. Is it kind of like uh, they're, they're at that office? I mean, it sounds like you have a pretty active office. I can hear some stuff on the, the uh, intercom. Yes. Yeah, uh, so they're, is it they're here. Is that yeah, what you would regard as a, like an integrative medical yeah, this community? Is a, yeah, this is an integrative medical community. Absolutely. The, all the okay. doctors are uh, uh, either do functional medicine or integrative medicine. Um, there's a lot of different doctors here um, and different clinicians and so forth. Yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, I, I, I hear more and more about those type of practices that are popping up and I'm, I'm so grateful that, you know, that, People are kind of opening their, uh, uh, opening their eyes to different possibilities and, and going that route. Um, it, it just seems like it's opening so many doors to um, maybe a, a better way of practicing medicine. Maybe I'll put that label on it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I think um, that uh, it serves the community well. I, I think that... Um, that complicated problems, most of the progressive problems, most of the middle age problems, that, that classically uh, conventional medicine doesn't do a very good job with. Uh, they do a very good job at trying to manage those illnesses. But right. 
you know, you'll never hear a conventional physician talk about curing something like diabetes or right. you know, something of that nature. Uh, where, where, you know, we're really trying to, and we can't always do this because I think there's so many variables into disease states and dysfunctions that you can't know all of them. But at least what we're trying to do is trying to do a deeper dive into the causality and to try to change that. Because, yes. I mean, there's some really basic things that, you know, you have epigenetics and, and what influences epigenetics? Well, the internal and external environment influence epigenetics. So what does that mean? So the epigenetics then feeds the genetic code that the gene needs to be making. So theoretically, if you can change the information that the epigenetics is getting, then you can change uh, the outcome of the genetics that um, the associated gene is uh, producing. So, yeah. I mean, that's just, and, and they have that, that uh, down in Germany because you know, if you go to Germany, you go to one of these incredible clinics. I mean, the first thing they're trying to do is change both the internal environment uh, and the external environment for you in whatever ways that they can at that time. And they use other uh, assess, 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 assessing devices to get uh, different information that allows them to uh, make uh, bigger and bigger diagno diagnoses. Right. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm seeing things like uh, biofeedback machines used on a more regular basis. And I, I, I see, I mean, that, that, that always impresses me because it can really can go to all parts of the body and seems to have, um, uh, you know, I mean, anyway, I, I don't know how it's done, but um, I hear nothing but good things about, uh, you know, biofeedback. There's machines that do that. And of course you mentioned having that sort of sensitivity with your hands. And I, I have a number of practitioner friends that they use sort of a biofeedback um, system as well. And it's something they use, you know, kind of their intu intuition to tap into. But when you get into um, machines that also do that and can spit out, you know, what issues you have in your body um, based on this machine, that's, that's always very impressive to me. Um, yeah, well, because it, it can become more a conventional device if it's found in a box, so to speak. Right. Well, that's, that, <laughs> goes back to my doctoral thesis and my entire point in terms of trying to validate this work. So I used, mm. ultimately, when I began, there was no way to validate it. All there was, was there was a, a greater way of getting more information to explain what the hell was going on right. up under my hands, right? But by the time I got my doctorate in integrative medicine and was exposed to heart rate variability, that's a classical piece of medical equipment, period. It's objective hmm. and reproducible. So I That's ran it. over 200 studies before and after on my patients. And what we saw was a significant drop in the sympathetic tone, which again, most people hmm. in this country and in the world are hypervigilant. And then we saw more importantly, with a weak parasympathetic system, we saw that upregulate. And that's, that's critical because again, that affects immunity and regeneration of the body. Uh, so, oh. uh, so that's, you know, I did over 200 studies. So, so many studies that I actually stopped using the machine for a while because I could see that 80 to 90% of my patients were upregulated sympathetically and had gotcha. a weak and had a weak parasympathetic system. Gotcha. So, and that machine so, you're referring to is a type of biofeedback machine. Well, it's called heart rate variability. And, uh, okay. the guy that developed it was Russian. His name was, um, uh, Dr. Rifton. Okay. And he did all the research on that at New York um, University. And um, I've taken multiple courses from him. He's a really great guy. And um, it is a really effective piece of equipment. And um, but, you know, I wanted to be able to uh, validate this and sub substantiate it with something yes. that was considered, uh, you know, a piece of um, valid medical equipment. And that's, that's what I attempted to do in my research. And, uh, and uh, although what I present is one case study, I, I've actually done it, you know, for long periods of time to about 200, 200 cases. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. fantastic. So yeah. um, one other thing I had written down here was, uh, so the practice you use also can be used when people have uh, like traumatic 
brain injury or they have concussions uh, due to sports and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I started out very early on um, uh, treating traumatic brain injury. I, I started, the Hopkins people started to know who I was because I was living in that, that part of the world. And uh, they would send me people or, or infants that had been um, that had suffered birth trauma uh, pretty significantly. Mm. And one, at one time I saw a one day old infant and what ends up happening sometimes when they come out of the birth canal is that the occiput, which is at the base of the skull is actually four little pieces that aren't actually fused together. And if you're not careful, you can overstretch that a little bit. And what it did is it influences this infant's vagal nerve and spinal okay. accessory nerve. So he had a tiny bit of torticollis, but the major complaint is that he was projectile vomiting, uh, the mother's milk, and right. uh, was very, very colicky. So I had to go in just very, very gently. You don't need much force with, with babies at all. And, and try to rebalance the, the uh, internal tissue tensions on the dural membrane and kind of facilitate the bones to go back where they're supposed to be. And then gotcha. I did some work in the internal organs to downregulate or quiet that down. And I think they brought the baby to me one more time and it was done. Wow. Yeah. So it started there. And then, uh, you know, I had an experience where my own son, uh, he had, he was on this, he was on the spectrum. And okay. uh, this was, uh, and, and it was pretty bad for a while because he stopped making eye contact. And mm. the, but the problem with that is, and, and I'm speculating here a little bit, but I, my feeling is, is he would continue to get these chronic ear infections. And um, through those chronic ear infections, he, he developed, uh, you know, a, a speech impediment and speech problems. And then he then he wouldn't make eye contact with you. Then he wouldn't speak at all. So, Boy. you know, it was like, wow, you know, you don't know, really know what's going on in this kid's head. But it, it seems to me that he was he was overdosed on amoxicillin because there's a, a okay. tremendous amount of serotonin that's in the GI tract that communicates with the brain. And I think there was some deformation there that was not happening uh, in order for that communication to be working. And gotcha. so um, it, that was a very, very scary time for me. But what I would do is, uh, unfortunately, I was just starting my practice. So I would not get home sometimes until nine, 10 o'clock at night. And but it was a good time for him because he was sleeping. And then I could do this work on him while he was asleep. So that's wow. that was where I really started to get into working with infants and children. And then here I developed there was a homeopathic pediatrician. My partner at the time was a social worker, and I had a lot of people that mentored with me, and uh, I, I treated just nothing but infants and children for three to four years. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, worst case scenarios, and uh, many, many of them did extremely well with the work. And so, um, so that was all part of the experience and the development in my training, Um as I uh, then started to get more and more into traumatic brain injuries. And recently I've been working for the last two or three years with a neurofeedback specialist by the name of Dr. Mary Esty and uh, got our work is like hand in glove um, in terms of the results that we get. Uh, because with traumatic brain injury, you don't find a concussion with uh, without a C1, C2 problem, because the, the dura mater of the brain attaches to that area. And so oftentimes okay. that's a very, very um, precarious area to be treating and working in and resolving it. And uh, one example, which is very interesting, going back to how we put all this together with the extracellular matrix and so forth, is that I was seeing a patient who was 17 years old, uh, it's a very, very smart individual, very dedicated to her soccer. She had five concussions. Oops. Five, yeah. And she came in in the middle of August, so she had some shorts on, and I did just observing what, what was going on with her. And I found that in the distal tibia, which is an area very close to the ankle, 
but it actually had a torsion in it, like a, a little rotation, okay? And I asked her what happened to the ankle. And she said, well, I tore all my ligaments in there and they uh, had to put me in a boot, okay, for 12 weeks. And what happens is if that boot doesn't create a retraction of those ligaments, it's an extensive surgical procedure to make that correction. So fortunately, the correction was, the self-correction was made by being in the boot, but this distortion still remained. Gotcha. So I was, as I was doing my body scan, of course, there was no motion in that distortion of, of the of distal tibia. There was absolutely no motion in the liver. And by the time I got to the base of her skull and her brain, I, I mean, it was like a nightmare in terms of the internal motility, the amplitude, uh, everything was reduced. Uh, so I had my work cut out for me, but then I had to figure okay. out, I had to figure out then, okay, where's my entry point into this person's system, right? So if I started at her brain, I would have blown her out of the water immediately. So I decided to start at her ankle. Right. Okay. So I'm at her ankle. I'm treating that. And within five minutes, I reproduce every single concussion symptom that this patient had. Okay. Headaches, huh. dizziness, vertigo, uh, you name it. How would you explain that? Right. Right. I'm asking you. Oh, <laughs> I have no idea. That's, that's pretty okay. crazy. Yeah. The simple way of explaining it is through the extracellular matrix. Okay. Again, the extracellular matrix surrounds and is continuous and attaches every cell and every organ together. And that's what I was working in. And that's what reproduced this patient's symptoms. Gotcha. So by the end of the session, you know, I told her mom, when you have a yeah. patient with traumatic brain injury, you can't just focus on the cranium or on the brain right. itself. You have to focus on prior injuries that could influence the rate of healing of the concussion and injuries that are also sustained during the concussion, because all of them have an influence on the motility of the brain, more importantly, the fluidity of the brain, because anytime you have traumatic brain injury, you have a stasis event that occurs. And that just simply means a poor exchange of fluids going in and out of the brain. So typically a neurologist may send the patient home and say, I don't want you to have any stimulus whatsoever. Right. But in the meantime, with every injury, this happens, there's a stasis and inflammatory response. So the cerebral spinal fluid, which is pristine and vitally important for the brain that slows down, it gets stuck. The venous flow is totally dependent on gravity that runs through that membrane system. If that membrane system is taut, which often happens for a number of different reasons, then you're going to have a reduction of venous blood flow in the brain. And then it can also affect very small arterioles, but the cerebral spinal fluid and the venous drainage are the two major things that are influenced with these concussions, as gotcha. well as a distortion in the entire membrane system. So, um, so those are the things. And it's, it's strange because, you know, I do the same cadaver dissections that, that the neurologists do, and we're trained very much in the same stuff. And you would think that they would have a better understanding of the importance of this fluid exchange and the toxicity levels that develop without a uh, normal uh, fluid exchange. Um, but wow. um, many of them don't get it at this point. And, right. um, you know, initially when I got out of school, I, I, I had this altruistic attitude that I was going to change the world. And and turn everybody onto this because I could speak the same language that they could never happened, had right. to happen through the patient. And well, still I'm so happened. glad that you're able to uh, think it outside still the happened box through the patient. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm so very happy that you're able to think outside the box and, and make these, uh, the, these healings happen. Um, well, you know, it's, it's, um, it's my life's work and, you know, I keep, if I find something that I can add to it, it's great. It's like just understanding that every modality has the potential to influence the extracellular matrix and influence the autonomic nervous system. I mean, so everything is included in this work, but this work is bigger in, that, in the way that I can go in, 
like with an acupuncture needle, you can't manipulate the, the liver. Okay. I can go in and manipulate the liver, you know, that if, if that's needed, you know? Right, right. So, so those, are, it's just, it's just wonderful work. There's a, like 75% of everybody that I treat for what, regardless of what reason they come in, they do some level of psycho emotional work. And so, you know, being able to meet the patient where they're at is, is, is really what I do. That's, that's what I do. Well, thank you so much. This is, this has been amazing. Is there anything else that um, you wanted to hit on before we go? We've talked about so much. Um, I, I, I don't think so. I just think that, um, you know, I've been practicing this work for 25 years. It's been evolving uh, since I've, I've started studying it. And um, so it is even now, it's difficult to express and explain because we're, we're really dealing with a physics model. Uh, and I try, to, I try to bring that down to the most elementary forms that I can, but it's, it's still a little bit of difficult. It's, there's still a little difficulty in the understanding of it. But once you experience it, uh, typically that removes all doubt. So wonderful. I guess I'll leave it at that. Yes. No, fantastic. Yeah. Well, once again, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's, it's always an oppor a great opportunity for me to, to get this work out. Manual regulation therapy uh, has been huge for me and um, a huge for my patients. So, you know, it's my passion in life. And um, that's about it. Mm -hmm.